So tonight I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Claudia Nishiewicz. We are gonna discuss some of the major arthropod pests and diseases that we see in our summer squash here in Utah and the Intermountain West. And honestly, most, if not all of these pests can also affect pretty much all of our cucurbit crops. So this can include melons, cucumbers, winter squashes as well. So when I was thinking about the common insect pests that commonly affect our summer squash, there's easily five that I've been seeing quite a bit this season. That includes flea beetles, earwigs, squash bugs, thrips, and aphids. So those are the five that we'll focus on tonight. So to keep this presentation brief, I have posted some general description and biology information on the slides. Then when I speak on the pests, I'll focus more on the damage they cause and then how you can manage them. So starting with flea beetles, flea beetles adults, um, or flea beetles, how, here's a picture of them, first of all, you can kind of see what they look like. The adults, they use visual and chemical kind of smell cues to find their host plants. And they chew holes or pits into leaves of cotyledons. So as you can see here, here's a photo of a squash plant that's just freshly germinated and it already has some damage. So if you guys have seen anything like this, comment it in the chat because flea beetles have been very problematic this year. On plants with thinner leaves, such as like mustards, potatoes, um, brassicas, the adults can cause these small rounded little holes that we sometimes call shot holes. And then on plants with leaves that are thick and waxy, such as like these squash cotyledons, you can also see these little pits that get chewed into there. So the high mobility of flea beetles can make management really challenging. So it's important that we understand their biology and life cycle and help identify effective strategies and optimal timing to reduce their negative impact. So when management, managing flea beetles is warranted, a combination of cultural, physical, biological, and chemical options should be used. So first I recommend scout your plants for damage Use yellow sticky traps, set those out in amongst your cucurbits and monitor for populations. If your sticky traps started to get a bunch of those flea beetles on, then you know it's probably time to implement some management. Um, gardeners can adjust planting times to avoid peak flea beetle activity. You can promote healthy, fast growing plants to minimize the vulnerability of the flea beetles. So a lot of growers will start their squashes indoors in a greenhouse and then transplant them outside. So that's a good option. At the end of the season, you can remove old plant residue and nearby weeds because those can serve as an alternate host for flea beetles. And then of course, row covers like in this picture, those can be used to create a physical barrier against flea beetles and other pests. The thing though with row covers on our summer squash is you might, you will have to remove them to allow for that open pollination to occur. And then there are some um, natural predators of flea beetles like lacewing, lacewing larva, adult big-eyed bugs, damsel bugs, all of those might feed on flea beetles. So it's important that we encourage those natural predators. Um, flea beetles are highly mobile so usually spray treatments can be tricky, but if you feel like um, spray treatment is warranted at your site, you can consider insecticide options with active ingredients like carborol, pyrethrin, cyfluthrin, permethrin, pyrethrin, and spinosad. So the next one you guys are probably familiar with is earwigs. So I don't even need to describe it. You guys probably know what they look like. Here's a photo of one right here. Earwigs, they're really problematic because they can feed on the buds, flowers, fruit, and tender squash seedlings. And they can really skeletonize the leaves. So here's a photo of a young summer squash plant where you can see the earwig just completely skeletonize the foliage. And it can pretty much kill, kill off crop yields and cause a lot of aesthetic injury too. 
Um, earwigs, they like to crawl into tight, dark places and they like to spend um, during the day or dark places to spend during the daytime. And then at night is when they're most active. They're unwanted present, presence in harvested vegetables as well. So since earwigs can be both beneficial and detrimental to crops, we only wanna consider treatment when we find a lot of damage like this we see here. And it's good to note that earwigs are more abundant in highly irrigated and mulched areas. So that's something to be aware of. So when we manage earwigs, one of the best thing we could do is kind of trap them or make bait traps. So you can place boards, corrugated cardboard or rolled up crumpled newspaper um, near the site and then they'll crawl under there and then in the morning you can capture and destroy them. Here's a photo of a homemade trap my wife and I made. We used the empty yogurt container and we put several of these out on our farm site and we filled it with canola oil and then soy sauce. And that smelly oil is what attracts the earwigs and some other pests as well. So a couple of days later, when I went out and checked, you can see in this photo, there's just tons and tons of earwigs in here. So this is a great option for home gardeners to capture them. And then of course, some cultural methods you can do is to just reduce the nesting and hiding places. So if you have a lot of debris laying around, you might want to move that so there's no place for those earwigs to hide. <clears throat> so the next one is squash bugs. So even though um, squash bugs are super common, everyone seems to know about them. It's super critical that you familiar, familiarize yourself with what they look like. Because still, a lot of people might confuse them with other true bugs in the order Hemiptera. Squash bugs, they have these long piercing sucking mouth parts that can cause the following symptoms. Scars, um, sunken areas on the fruits, um, wilted foliage during the day due to lack of plant sap flow. And then it can just cause complete plant decline like you see here. One of the most important strategies is reducing squash bug populations through careful monitoring and the removal of the eggs. So you can see in this photo right here, um, one way to remove and kill eggs is to use duct tape. So you can just place the duct tape on these eggs, which are usually laid on the underside of the squash leaves. You can just pull them off. Um, you can also smear the eggs with like petroleum jelly, or you can just cut them out with scissors. And I think that's gonna be the best way for home gardeners and small kind of farmers. So if you guys go out tonight after this presentation, check all of your squash bugs, or squash bugs, check all your squash plants, dig around the surface near the base of the plants and see if there's any of the overwintering adults around. And then also check the undersides of your leaves and do that every other night for the next couple of weeks and I promise that will help you stay on top of their populations. So when I'm done speaking, I'm gonna link a video and infographic into the chat, which you guys should watch and review. Um, it covers all things squash bug and management. So I'll definitely include that so you guys can get your full squash bug content. So the next one is another super common pest we see on a lot of vegetables, including our summer squash, and that's thrips. So thrips are tiny, very tiny, like they're about one millimeter big. And honestly, they look like a tiny little speck of brown orange dust moving around. But thrips are a problem because they feed with a punch and suck behavior. And this can cause light flecking wounds and silvery scars on our foliage. So this is what it looks like on some squash leaves. Then sometimes I'll leave dark little spots of their fecal matter. So that could be another indicator. And thrips populations increase under hot air conditions. So especially right now here in all of Utah, we're getting those really hot dry conditions. So the best way to manage these thrips is to, you can plow or just lightly disc underneath plant debris after you harvest and remove a lot of the volunteer plants as those can serve as a host. 
Um, at early in the season, if you're bringing in transplants, you want to check them with like a hand lens and make sure there's no thrips on them. And then you can use um, like overhead irrigations or just a strong stream of water to spray down the plants. If you do find a lot of thrips, like shown in this photo, that can help knock their populations back. And then of course, we always recommend good sanitation. So removing weeds in and around your garden or vegetable field, because that can serve as an alternate host and for a lot of pests. And if you feel like the thrips populations is really bad, then you can consider some insecticides with active ingredients like pyrethrin, zeta cypermethrin, neem oil, and insecticidal soap. So the last insect I wanna talk about is aphids. So aphids, you guys should be pretty familiar with. There's tons and tons of species. The ones that you might find on your summer squash include the melon aphid, which I put a photo here. There's also a green peach aphid, potato aphid. Um, those are other ones that you might, those are other common ones, I should say, that you might come across. So here's a photo of a large colony of melon aphids on the underside of a squash leaf. So you can see like how big their populations get. So it's important to note that aphids um, do not generally attack cucurbits until the vines form runners. So melon and green aphids attack cucumbers, melon, pumpkin, squash, and then potato aphids like cucumbers, pumpkins, and squash as well. Um, one of the major concerns of aphids is their ability to transmit plant viruses. So over there's over 100 different viruses that can be transmitted by aphids, which is annoying, right? And Claudia is going to touch on some of the viruses when she speaks here in a second. So when we manage aphids, we want to avoid excessive fertilization because aphid populations uh, or aphid densities tend to be higher on plants that have excess nitrogen fertility. You can consider using mulches or row covers. Some studies have found that metallicized or reflective mulches and row covers can help reduce aphid populations in not only summer squash, but other vegetables as well. Um, Cause it kind of, the reflection interferes with the aphids ability to find the host plants. Um, don't plant vegetable crops near overwintering hosts. So important thing to know about aphids life cycle is they have a lot of woody hosts that they overwinter on. So that can include fruit trees, landscape, landscape plants and trees. So consider that. At the end of the season, you can remove, destroy plant debris. Disking fields immediately after harvest will destroy alternate host plants and reduce available aphids and virus sources. And then of course, maintain healthy and vigorous plants as those tend to be more tolerant of aphid attacks. And then another interesting method is depending on where you live, you could plant your crops upwind. So planting upwind can help decrease on um, the effect of the aphid migration to your plants just because it would blow them away. But again, that's kind of really location specific and weather specific. So many aphids have developed a resistance to a number of different insecticides, including some pyrethroids, carbamates, and organophosphates. So additionally, when you're selecting insecticides, if you feel like you need to use it, um, you could use some that are less damaging to like natural enemies of aphids. So this can include like insecticidal soap, neem oil, or similar to the thrips. You can just use like a strong stream of water to spray them off. And of course, we always want to include our natural predators. So like lady beetles, lacewing, surfeit flies, and parasitic wasps. These can play a crucial part in helping suppress aphid populations. So those again, just kind of cover some common insects that we see on our summer squash. So I'll link more information about those in the chat that you guys can review. So now I'm gonna give it over the screen time over to Claudia, and she's gonna to talk to us about different diseases that we can see in our cucurbit crops. Thank you, Nick. Let me see if I can share my screen. Let's see. 
Can everybody see it? Yep, you're good. Okay, as Nick mentioned, I'm going to talk about diseases of squash. And as he mentioned, all these diseases you cannot only find on summer squash, but also melons, cucumbers, winter squash, pumpkins, gourds. I start with a virus that's actually aphid transmitted watermelon mosaic virus. 2013 to 2016, we saw quite a bit of watermelon mosaic virus in commercial fields. It affects summer squash, winter squash, pumpkins, and zucchinis. It causes color breaking and warts on the fruit, and it can cause mosaic and distortion of leaves. And some of the distortion almost looks like 2,4-D damage. They're transmitted by aphids in a non-persistent manner. So the aphids have to feed on an infected plant every time before they're able to transmit it. So they feed, they have a few virus particles stuck to their stylet, and then they insert their stylet into a new plant. And in the process, they leave the virus particles behind and they infect the next plant. So here are some symptoms. You can see the, the leaf distortion here on, on the sleeve in the upper left corner. There's some mosaic pattern. It's, it's not that easy to see. At the bottom right, you can see the dark green, light green patterns a little bit better. It sometimes depends on the variety or the squash type, depending on the symptoms that you can see. On the fruit, the symptoms are more pronounced. You often get that color breaking. So these are all ripe summer squash and pumpkins, yet they're still having some green coloration with them. You also can see the warts that are developed on a young banana squash. The management of watermelon mosaic virus is difficult. There are some resistant summer squash varieties, but a lot of them are genetically modified. There are no resistant pumpkin or winter squash varieties. Good weed control can help clover, common mallow, can be alternate hosts, and also avoid planting close to alfalfa fields. Alfalfa can also carry the virus, and they often also have a lot of aphids in them. And every time that alfalfa gets mowed or the hay gets cut, the aphids are looking for another green host to feed on. And if you're squash and pumpkins are nearby, that's where they're going to migrate to. And then they can spread the virus to your plants. And we had one field where you could actually see after the aphids moved across the ditch from the alfalfa field, the virus symptoms showing up in a wave going slowly across the field as the aphids moved on. Now I move on to uh, fungal diseases for the rest of the presentation. Powdery mildew is probably the most common one that we see in Utah. It goes to a lot of Utah vegetables, but most commonly it's on cucurbits. It damages the vegetables because it reduces the ability of the plant to photosynthesize. The leaves are being covered by the fungus, the white powdery stuff you see on the leaves. And so they can't take up enough sunlight to produce sugar and high quality fruit. And so you get reduced yield, reduced quality. And in some cases, if the leaves get necrotic and they die, the fruit can get sunburned that's below it. So here you see some pictures of powdery mildew. These are the early stages where you can still make out individual colonies. And then here you have entire leaves that are completely covered. When you want to manage powdery mildew, you need to start when the, you still see the first individual colonies. If a leaf is completely covered in powdery mildew, you have lost the battle already. Here's a generated life cycle of powdery mildew. So powdery mildew survives in the winter time on plant debris on the ground in fruiting structures that carry overwintering spores. These spores are released in the spring as new leaves emerge. Spores land on those new leaves. They germinate, colonize the leaf. And then about seven days after the germination, you see those first white colonies develop. 
Now the fungus switches to producing a different type of spore that it can produce in large masses, large quantities for mass distribution. And these spores are called conidia and they are often produced in chains and they break off very easily. So even a light wind can just move them off onto a new plant and then they reinfect new leaves. This cycle will repeat itself every seven to 10 days all summer long. When the weather conditions or the plant's health declines, the fungus realizes it has to do something to survive. Powdery mildew is an obligate parasite. It can only grow on living plant tissue. It cannot grow on dead plant tissue. So if the leaves die, it has to go into survival mode. So it starts switching from producing conidia to producing the fruiting structures that are called casmothesia. And they contain those overwintering spores that will then reside in those fruiting structures until conditions become favorable again, and then they are released. So to manage powdery mildew, there are resistant cucurbit varieties available. Usually the varieties, when you look on the seed package, will either have a PM for powdery mildew, or in some cases, they might have a PX for Podosphere exanthii, which is the scientific name of the powdery mildew. Remove infected plant material at the end of the growing season to prevent overwintering of the inoculum, as well as plant spacing. If you increase plant spacing, you get more air movement going through your plants. And powdery mildew is a fungus that does not like it wet. It just needs a little bit of humidity for maybe three, four hours so the spores can germinate, but it does not like rain or standing water on the leaves. If you plant the plants a little bit further apart, you get air movement, you can reduce the humidity and any dew on the leaves will dry up even faster before the spores have a chance to germinate. Chemical control sulfur products work very well for most powdery mildews. Read the label if the product registered for the crop you want to use it on. Do not apply sulfur above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It will fry your plants and you get something like this. So these are melons, two varieties that were sprayed in high heat with sulfur. So this variety here, yeah, all those leaves were fried to a crisp. The center variety, that one row, did not take it quite as hard. So you want to avoid that. So if you apply sulfur, either spray it very early in the morning, so there's two, three hours time for the leaves to dry off before you reach 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or wait until late in the evening after it cooled down below 90 degrees Fahrenheit before you apply sulfur. Other products include chlorothalonil that you can use, or Kali Green might be another option. Occasionally, we see rhizopus or co and coanephora rot. So rhizopus is a common fungus. It's a bread mold. You can find it sometimes on bread and other vegetables. It can occur on squash in storage. It enters the squash through tiny wounds that are caused by insects or sand. So this picture below, this pumpkin was in a field where very strong winds just blew the sand across and this fruit was basically sandblasted. And so all the fruit that were put in storage had rhizopus growing around the area where the stem was. The temperature for that fungus, it prefers 59 degrees to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And if there's high humidity or moisture present, that's ideal growing conditions for it. There's not much you can do. You can, all you can do is basically throw the vegetables away, away so you're not leaving all those spores there and they can infect other vegetables, not only squash. And it grows very fast. It can grow to this in like 
two or three days before. So you won't see anything and two or three days later you look and it's all there. Coanephora is another fungus that affects the blossoms and fruit of summer squash. Warm temperatures above 75 degrees Fahrenheit and moist conditions. So something like a high tunnel or greenhouse production, you could see it. It's a short-lived disease. So as soon as the conditions change, the disease will stop and you won't see any new infections occur. And there are, just like for rice, of course, there are no control measures. Remove the infected fruit. So when you look at this fruit here, you see the white, which is the mycelium growing on the, the fruit. And all these black dots you see are masses of spores. So I would recommend that you remove any symptomatic fruit while it's still white. You see only the white mycelium before you can see all these masses of spores that could then be transferred to other fruit and flowers. I talk a little bit about Pythium. Pythium is a soil-borne pathogen. It can cause unsquashed Pythium fruit rot. There are several different species that can cause the disease. And it has a, a fairly large host range, alfalfa, small grains, and basically any vegetable. The symptoms you see, occasionally you see a root rot, but very, very rarely on, on squash. If you do see a root rot, you will get stunted and wilting plants, and you also do get a fruit rot. And it's usually the fruit that's lying on the surface of the ground. This is what the disease looks like. Again, you get this, similar to coronephora, you get this cottony mycelium growing, except in this case, you will not get those black spores developing. This is all you will see, and then it liquefies the fruit in a few days. Pythium is a soil-borne pathogen and its spores are motile. They have hair-like appendages that can swim in a film of water and basically move from plant to plant or fruit to fruit. Management, drip irrigation can reduce the amount of moisture in the soil and reduce the ability of the spores to move. Plastic mulch, so the fruit is not sitting on top of the, the dirt. And then the chemical control is very limited. It's mostly for commercial growers. Mephenoxam, following the label as a soil drench, can reduce the root rot, but it's ineffective against fruit rot. Last few years, we have occasionally seen gummy stem blight. It's caused by a fungus called Didymella prionia. It can affect all plant parts except for the roots. It's inoculum, it can be seed borne. Weeds can carry it and then plant debris from previous cucurbit crops. Some of the common hosts are watermelon and squash. You get necrotic spots on the leaves of seedlings and older plants. You get cracks in the stems and you see gum oozing from the stems, but that's not always present. And if the gum isn't present, the diagnosis isn't that easy because other diseases and conditions could cause necrotic spots on leaves and it could cause cracks in stems. And you also get a fruit rot. So here you see a watermelon plant that's infected with gummy stem blight. You see the leaves that are dying. These symptoms apply to other diseases like various root rots as well. So in this case, we would have to try and isolate the pathogen and look at the roots to determine if it is gummy stem blight or some other cause of the problem. Here on the upper right where that arrow is, you can see a droplet of gum that's oozing from the stem. That's very characteristic for this disease. Here you can see a cracked stem. And then you see those leaf spots that are developing on the leaves. On butternut squash, the symptoms are very characteristic. You get these circular ornate patterns caused by the pathogen. On acorn squash, it's just a fruit rot. It, you know, the fruit is giving you this black lesion 
and it's just rotten. And this could be caused by other pathogens as well. And again, we would have to isolate or look on the surface of the rotten fruit for spores to determine what is the causal agent. Management of gummy stem blight, you certify disease-free seed. It might be a little bit more expensive than non-certified seed, but in the end, it could save you a lot of money if you don't get the disease. Or you can use seed that's treated with a fungicide. Disc and plow under old cucurbit crop debris. If you get that a foot, foot and a half into the ground, the fungus cannot survive for long. Remove volunteer cucurbit plants. They can carry the pathogen. Crop rotation for two to three years with non-host plants. Gummy stem blight is specific to cucurbits. So anything other than cucurbits for two or three years in that spot would be very beneficial. And there are some preventative fungicides that could be used. <clears throat> 